What's up, everybody? Jack here, and today I'm going to be talking with Ty, who What's represents Amic. What's up? What's going on, Jack? Thanks for the invite, man. I'm excited. Ah, uh, no, not at all, man. It's a pleasure for me. I love as I, we were chatting a little bit earlier, and I, I love these calls. It's so cool to be able to talk to so many different individuals, and I've personally learned so much just from putting myself out there and talking to people. Um, it's funny, there's times where people call me and they think that they're going to learn more from me and they just tell me this amazing, cool business and all this stuff about their lives. And I get so much information, even though people contact me and they're trying to have me give them information. I feel like I end up getting more information. Pretty awesome. Anyway, tell us about yourself. What's, uh, so what, what is Hammock real quick before we get into the questions we were going to talk about? Um, yeah. Definitely. So Hammock's a listing, delisting, cross-listing service uh, using virtual assistants. That's what my background is. Um, I run a seven-figure Amazon store um, doing a thing called Marketplace to Marketplace Arbitrage. And then my co-founder, he ran a, um, a large uh, VA company for Fortune 500 companies. We kind of merged um, because we saw that our, both of our other companies hit like a, a peak or like a kind of like a soft, a soft cap. So we wanted to start something new and we've been growing this since December. Um, again, what we do is just do listings, cross and delistings, accounting, um, and some on FBA um, sourcing as well. So most of your clients are eBay sellers or? Yeah, probably about 90% of our eBay sellers, about 10% are FBA sellers that are doing wholesale. We do like wholesale um, uh, sourcing for them through um, wholesale clients. We do all like the light work for them as well. Yeah, so, so guys, just so you know, I, I met uh, Ty and Sid, who's the other guy he mentioned about, um, through Chris Lin, who runs the YouTube channel Daily Refinement. And Chris introduced me, you guys, or you guys to me, telling me that uh, you guys were basically helping his audience get virtual assistants. And this is quite interesting, because a lot of physical eBay sellers would benefit from using virtual assistants, but they're typically, they don't use virtual assistants, whereas drop shippers use virtual assistants all the time. So it's kind of interesting how there's, they both benefit, but drop shippers are way more likely to actually find them, whereas physical eBay sellers often get caught up in the act of finding a virtual assistant and they think it's too complicated and all that kind of stuff. But obviously that's not true. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. You kind of hit on top of head. Like I think drop shippers, they kind of have to do that, right? Because they need to have a lot of people doing all like light work in the background to yeah. grab all scale. The products. Right? Exactly. Um, and, and, and the margins are a bit smaller. Um, physical eBay stores, you can make, there's margins are higher and people are very, very, we see a lot. The sole entrepreneur doesn't like having people working with them or they think they need to manage or like, there's a bit, like a bunch of thought processes that go in that, which is kind of, it's, it's, it's hard to break through that, that thought process with people. It's interesting. That's cool. So tell me, tell me a bit about yourself. What, did, what are you trying to do now? Um, what, what put you in a situation where you're doing your own like online company thing? You know, these are, uh, these are, these are interesting. To me. Also, you seem, you seem younger than... So one of the things I've noticed that's kind of surprising to me, actually, is most of the people I talk to who are interested in self-employment or any kind of online business, they have one of two main demographics. Um, they are in their 40s to 50s and thinking about retirement, motivated by retirement, or they have children. They're like, I, I almost never talk to young people. It's really surprising. Like most of the people I talk to are between 30 and 50. And it's, it's, that's not what I would expect. I would think that more young people are using technology for their living, but it appears that most young people are kind of caught up in the system, so to speak. They're tr still trying to get degrees, still trying to do traditional business. So you tell us about Jack, yourself. Man. Yeah, let me, I'll answer that question. I'll kind of jump in that. I think that, that, that's a fascinating point, right? I'm, my thought process is two things. One, the older demographic understands to get to the next level or the financial freedom, they have to build their own business, right? Yeah. Like younger people, they get taught at an early age that they have to go to college. Like even my parents, right? My parents, I'm a first generation uh, college, uh, college grad. But like my parents are like, you got to go to school, you got to get a job, blah, 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 blah. So that's, that's maybe the reason my thought process is of why that, that happens. But yeah, yeah. Um, talk about, uh, so my background was um, went to school in Arizona um, and then started working at a VC firm, um, like as a um, like associate mid-college. Um, that kind of got me. What, is, what does that uh, stand for? 
venture capital, um, okay. venture capital firm that does like um, high growth startups and stuff like that. Um, that got me into like the startup game. Um, built my first product, launched on Kickstarter. I didn't hit like 10 grand, but I lost a hell of a lot of money on it. So it was a fail it was in general. It wasn't um, a fail. It, it, yeah. You got the path to success is paved with failure. True, 100%, right? That got me into like the VC firm. There's a whole different like ball game that kind of put me into the yeah. mindset as well. Um, then started uh, doing the Gary Vee 2017 Flip Challenge. That got me into the flip game. Um, did seven, uh, not seven figures, uh, six figures. I did about uh, 105K gross in seven months, my first seven months on eBay. Um, then built out a, um, a state company in Arizona doing high, high end luxury artwork. We flipped everything from like super rare art. Um, like uh, we have a Monet Renoir. Got um, that high kind of average sale price. Yeah, right there. It's wild, man. There's a, there's a lot of things in the, in the art world that's crazy. Um, did that uh, state downsize business, still did eBay. And um, um, then I jumped into Amazon in mid 2019. Did a thing called eBay to Amazon arbitrage. Basically like, it's like drop shipping. So you, 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 you'd, you would get the concept pretty, you're probably your video, your people that are on the channel probably get the concept as well. We'd buy, we'd buy um, bulk on eBay, right? Um, bring them in house and then, then FBA them to Amazon. Um, that got us to, in an eight month time frame. we went from zero to seven figures in eight months. And then um, then we're just starting to do that. Um, and then I have that automated right now. It hit that cap that I was talking about. Yeah. Um, about a $2 million cap, it caps out. So that's why me and my partner, Sid, um, jumped onto the hammock side um, and started building this VA automation because it's all a huge market demand in this and a big need for the market. So we said, okay, let's make this our, our platform. And then we started building it from there, worked with Chris, uh, Chris Lynn, and then we've been, we've been trying to grow it ever since. Pretty awesome. And so one of the things that you guys are looking for, because maybe someone watching this video is in this position, but correct me if I'm wrong here, but you're looking for people who represent or have the, a lot of respect of larger audiences that you can coordinate with these individuals to figure out how getting virtual assistance can help them in, in some way, right? So you guys are trying to find influencers who have an audience of people, like Chris is a perfect example. You wanna find more people like Chris, right? Yep, you and Chris, right? You're both, you, both are, you both have influence or, or along the resale community for sure. Um, also, even just even just people that want to work with us, we kind of bring them on. Like we we don't think of them as clients, right? We think of them as team members. Um, even if you want to be, become like that client slash team member, we're more than happy. That's kind of like our goal is to help people resell and resell better, right? Um, get their margins up, save more time, and make more money. That's kind of our, our overarching goal. It is like me and said we both have those our past businesses that were capped flow businesses, right? We're looking to really grow a massive a client team, right? So yeah. we can really blow this up as big as possible, become like the next, I don't know, eBay or something along those lines. Dude, right? I, I want I want a hundred things to replace eBay. I hate eBay now. <laughs> I don't hate yes. them, but I just think it's it's not a it's not a well run company, but that's a whole that's a separate whole thing. Different <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying crazy. So so say someone wants to get in touch with you guys, how how can they get in touch with you? Yep. So you can type a uh, ty t y at hammock h a m m o q dot com or hammock dot com, and you can go get the get started section in um on our website as well. So I'm I'm showing my screen, so I'm just gonna go there real quick. It's hammock h a m m o q dot com. Okay. Well, how did you guys come up with the name? I'm curious because yeah. I'm always around hammocks. There's hammocks all over the place in Nicaragua, so I'm curious. <laughs> Uh, we were thinking like sit back, relax, and the only thing we're thinking like a beach, and then we like we go with hammock. We had hammock data for a minute, and then we're like, okay, what can we spell hammock uniquely enough to get a dot com? Yeah. So that's what we put on the and then we got the dot com. Nice, that's cool. So let, let me ask you a question, Jack. So I mean, we talked about this a little bit beforehand. So I'm I'm heading out to for like a month in Croatia. Um, how do you stay focused? Um, like living abroad because I know even in the United States I get so off track sometimes. Yeah, and that's something that's that's a struggle for any person who's stepping away from the more traditional work life, right? Um, and I want to say that there's some easy way for you to not be like that, but unfortunately I think it really is a time thing. Um, yeah. you kind of have to become a person who 
will have a similar routine regardless of where you are and that is hard like it's if you are living in a home it's pretty easy to have a routine of what you do when you wake up but when you're waking up in a friend's house and some other hostel and some random place you have to kind of develop a new routine that is your routine when you're traveling and the only way to really do that is to travel and see what you struggle with and to just keep having that feedback loop with yourself. For me personally, uh, everything revolves around me eating. All of, all of my depression and times of unproductivity and all of this are triggered by a series of events that start with a failure to eat food and an increase in caffeination. So for yeah. me, the, the key to being productive while traveling is to make sure that I'm not having caffeine on an empty stomach. I'm Mm -hmm. always eating before I caffeinate. If I want coffee, okay, fine, but I have to eat food first. And two is to make sure I'm drinking a lot of water. Because if I get a headache, that is the most likely thing that's going to mess me up. It's going to get in the way of me working. It's gonna make me make less found decisions. I'm gonna be more likely to wanna go to sleep or be lazy or do something else because I'm in pain. So for me, the most effective way to increase my productivity is to focus on eating and drinking. It sounds silly, but these are like the basics. And aside from that, it's to take breaks from the computer. Like I get much better results. If every 30 or 45 minutes, I go do something else. I sweep the kitchen or just walk outside. Um, I'm pretty good about after a call, I'll get up and go get some water or go to the bathroom or do something. But if I'm really in the zone and I'm working, I can work for like an hour or two, and then I get kind of blurry, but I want to keep working, and it's a bad idea to. It's really important to take breaks while you still have the interest in doing something. That part's important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that, man. That's actually a good tip. I, I didn't even think about like the caffeinated ones. I haven't eaten today, and I just drink a, like a <laughs> relatively Red Bull, right? I'm just like, wild. Man. I'm like, okay, 100%. I like that. I like that, though. Cool. I like that, man. Other than that, like, um, and then do you, like, how do you set up those habits just in general? Is it just, just consistently do them over and over and over again, even while yeah, like, the easiest thing to do is whatever you did yesterday and the day before the hardest thing to do is whatever you didn't do yesterday. Okay. Really that I, I view that as the way of the world. Like anytime something's new, it's going to be hard, especially mm-hmm. if you didn't do it the past couple of days. But even if you do something hard, if you do it every day, that fourth day, you're probably not going to feel it's that hard anymore because you're in the habit of doing it. And hard things are just what we're thinking too much about. And we think that it's hard because of whatever reason. But really, everything in life is okay if you just keep moving forward. You know, it's, it, you're going to figure it out. You're going to get some breakthrough if you talk to the right person and you're going to know the easy way to do it. It's just a matter. Yeah. You're like, you got to know that way exists. Even if you don't know what it is, you can find it. Yeah, what is it like your body always like shoots for the easiest the least passive resistance the path of you know? least resistance yeah. yeah yeah all the time it consistently i know i'm the same way man like it hits, it hits me all the time like I, what can i do that does the least amount but yeah. i don't have to get thought process you want to do like the hardest things in the morning all that kind of stuff yeah yeah definitely that's something i i, I realized too is with like i mentioned earlier how i get in these times where i feel more depressed or Basically, like, I can test it because there's things that have changed my life. And if I think about doing these things, like making videos, I'll feel like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's not going to do anything. And my life is proof that that's not true. So anytime I I feel that way, I'm like, huh, I know that's not true. I feel like that's true. I'm obviously in a rut. And you kind of have to learn to not trust your perspective when you're like that. And it's tricky because you're going to live a better life if you fill your life with things that you feel meaningful with, right? But at the same time, in order to figure out what those meaningful things are, you have to do a lot of stuff that in the moment, you don't wanna do it. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing is afterwards, how do you feel? After you've done it for a couple days, do you feel good that you did it or do you feel worse? And that's the feeling that you really need to listen to because that's that's all that all that matters really life is a series of contradictions you know you got to work hard but if you work hard all the time what's the point in having uh, your own business you could have just worked hard all the time for someone and gotten paid right you know it's, yeah. it's it's a series of contradictions you got to make sure that you know the exceptions to the rules and just have a few phrases that you follow and do your best to take heed 
on that on that point of like working for somebody else in terms of that side like it's interesting a lot of like so entrepreneurs we see this often you might see it as well they work so hard 80 100 hours a week but they're making less than if they would be making if they would work for somebody else because they want to do it all themselves as well yeah. it's kind of interesting you know it's it's it's, it's a definitely contradiction that's how that. most people i've met who are in money don't have lives that i want and that was hard for me in the beginning because I met all these people who were traveling and working from a computer and making their own businesses and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be like that. But then mm -hmm. their lifestyles, a lot of them are, they're working constantly, very stressed about money, and they're not spending that much time with their friends and their family. And for me, like, I want to have enough time that I can spend an hour cleaning a day and two hours cooking and an hour or two talking with friends. That doesn't leave that much time left to work on stuff. Yep. And that's the scenario that makes me happier. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm happy to live that life, but at the same time, I get criticized all the time for not working more and that kind of thing. And that's, that's something that's another thing to keep in mind is that no matter what you do, there's gonna be critics. And yep. it's almost better that there are critics because that means you're doing something. But yeah. no matter what you do, you're never gonna be able to escape criticism or judgment. But maybe if a lot of people are judging you, that's an indication that you're doing something because people know you exist. Yep. Ultimately, that's what matters. People uh, in general are very cynical, very depressed, very frustrating to work with. But then you find those couple individuals who aren't like that and that's those are the people who make life worth it definitely definitely uh, let's go on the topic of like vas in general like what what do you think's the use case for vas why do you like vas is it just to save time is it to like offset um what you need to do do the boring work why do you what do you use uh, there's VAs? there's so many um at the, so at the moment i don't use any vas but i had virtual assistants for about a year and a half um and at the time my mentality was, all right, there's work I don't like doing that I need to do. What's the work I like doing the least? Okay, mm -hmm. make a VA do that stuff. And I was in a really lucky position because I can just make a video. Like I'm like, okay, here's the task. Make the video, publish it. Hey, guys, I need a VA to do this. Reach out to me. And then I have one. I don't need to like, go and hire one in a traditional way. And for me, I've had a better experience doing that because most of the people who watch my videos have some kind of connection to me. So mm -hmm. that connection means that they they work a little bit harder. They're a bit more like understanding. Um, they may know a bit about what I'm doing already because they were connected to me in the first place. But really, just it's it's a great example of one of those things that almost no matter who you are, you can use a VA to make your life easier and more effective. That's reality. You probably listening to this think, oh no, that's not true. I don't want to hire an employee. I don't want to think about it. But that's all bullshit. It's literally yep. not hard. It's not like hiring an employee in real life. You can literally just go to a website and have a VA within an hour. It's easy, yep. and you don't need to do any kind of crazy, complicated tax stuff. It's just a part of your business expense. It's not complicated. And people have all of these thoughts, and these thoughts are blocking them from doing the things that make their lives easier and better. And getting VAs is a perfect example of that. There's really no excuse that's good enough to not have a VA or at least not try it, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent, man. And, and like, I like, I like your saying of how you did, you took the VAs and they did the things that you did not want to do, right? Like why even own a business or why even work for yourself if you're doing the things that you just, just hate to do yeah. when they can be outsourced? I never understood that, right? I, I actually, I did, let me rephrase that. I, I did understand because I was that kind of way when I first started, right? When I was first doing a solo entrepreneurship stuff, like I was like, I'm going to do everything myself. I want to make the most money. But like you need to, you need to, the best entrepreneurs you see is they use other people's money and other people's time to grow their business. It's not just all, cause you only have so you only have 24 hours in a day, right? Yeah. Like you only have so much you can do at that time period. And if you can't, if you can't leverage other people's time or money, then it's impossible to do anything else. You alone you know is not a scalable concept. Yeah. 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 Like, well, so what do you like? What are those blockers that you think people have to like, why do you think that people can't, can't scale their business to next level or like they had those those blockers or they believe that they have to do it themselves that's just human at the moment human nature like one of sure. i mentioned earlier there's all these contradiction realities right one of the 
biggest lessons for me as an individual, especially in my career over the past like four or five years, is that um, I used to believe that if you just give people the answers to their problems, they're going to fix their problems. That isn't true. It's just not true. Um, most people won't fix their problems, even if they have the answers, because it's not a lack of answers that's stopping them. It's a lack of the habit of improving themselves. Because yep. everyone wants to be better. But most people are stuck in the habit of not doing the things that make them happier and not improving themselves. And yep. that's ultimately why I think people don't do that. It's because as, as a human, you have a choice. You, you have a life. And of course, you're either going to be happy with the state of your life or unhappy with it. But either way, you have to decide are you responsible for your life or is it someone else who you're going to blame? Yep. And most people aren't going to accept responsibility for their own lives. They prefer to just put the blame on other people. I'm in this position because my mother and my father fucked me over. They were alcoholics. I'm in this position because my father died when I was young and it fucked me over. I'm in this position because my ex-girlfriend left me and broke my heart. I'm in this position because I have depression. I'm stuck that way. That's how I am, right? These kind of mentalities are really common. They're in most people. And these are the reasons that people don't follow through and make the best decisions in their life. It's not because there aren't options. It's just because most humans aren't in a position where they're trying to improve. So all you really have to do is become a person who's trying to improve, even if you're failing. That's awesome. You are better off than most people. Learn. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Like, let me ask you this question then. Like, my like uh, my mentality's been you, you choose your life. You make your life how you want it to be, right? So, like, what made you go to down to Nicaragua and like like I'm, I'm guessing it was relatively a big change, right? Yeah, From it was a huge change. Were, exactly. Like, what what was like the th what made you change your life to do that kind well of okay i had so basically in my past i was really sick um i was struggling with lyme disease and chronic fatigue and people were telling me i was going to be sick for the rest of my life um and i couldn't work properly i just couldn't really get through the day without without needing to sleep i slept a lot more than most people didn't have uh, the same amount of energy and i'd kind of accepted that I was going to be like that for the rest of my life, and I had to figure something out for work because I couldn't work on a regular schedule. Um, so I started selling on eBay and then got into the whole drop shipping thing and started making YouTube videos about my drop shipping. That changed my life um, because that YouTube attention got the attention of some other YouTubers, and then I got invited to this event in Nicaragua called Grind Camp, and okay. it was... Uh, one month event where 30 individuals who earn money online live together that's yeah. it and the housing is free everything's paid for you just have to get to the country and feed yourself when you're there right yeah. so i came and i was able to get two weeks off of my job just nice. two weeks and i was like i don't know what's going to happen but if i go there i'm going to get the information i need i know it because at the yeah. time i thought that if i had the information to change my life i would just do it yeah. Right. So I yeah. went there. That was the first step. I didn't need to do that. I didn't have any That's money fine. saved up. I was living paycheck to paycheck at uh, working as a barista at Starbucks. And one of my coworkers had requested way too much time off. So he just covered all my shifts. And then I bought a ticket to Nicaragua and a laptop instead of paying my eBay bill. Didn't have any money, but I knew I can go into debt as long as I get my ass there. Because then I'm yep. going to meet these people, I'm going to get information from them, and I'm going to use this to change my life. So I went to Nicaragua, and that's when I saw the cost of living thing. And I conceptualized that you can actually earn $5 an hour in some countries, and that's good money. Like, yeah. whoa, I had no idea that was true. I just thought it was always abusive to pay someone $4 an hour. But then once I came to Nicaragua and I saw, holy shit, you can rent a fully furnished house in the capital for $300 a month. Like, the fuck is that? What? I had no idea. So coming to Nicaragua, that was the turning point in my life where it I no longer didn't have the information. 
Because from that point on, I had looked in the eyes of multiple different people who earned money online, and they all worked less and earned more money. I was like, the hell is this? <laughs> what is yeah. this? It, it completely blew my mind, and I, I was really excited back then. Um, but at the time, one of the reasons I was so excited is because I was really depressed in the U.S. I wasn't happy. I didn't know that many people. Most of the people I knew were complaining about their lives and weren't really trying to fix them that much. Um, I didn't feel that great, to be honest. And so I eventually went back to the U.S., and then that's when I just couldn't do it. I couldn't stay there. I'd, I'd, and then I moved back to Nicaragua. And in the beginning, it was hard, um, especially because I'm not fluent in Spanish. I don't know that many people. But now I know more people in Nicaragua. I've I dealt with all that hardship before, so now it's life is pretty easy. Like I don't really have I don't have to worry about my rent getting paid. There's I don't have to do anything. I just do things that I'm really interested in doing, and uh, I struggle sometimes. I'm not gonna. Th that's kind of one of the uncomfortable realities. Like I'm a person who for two and a half years hasn't had to do anything to have my mm -hmm. bills paid. Like, there's always more I can do to earn more money, but because I yeah. minimize my expenses to, I, I, I can get by with $400 a month, and I earn <laughs> that much passively, more than that passively. So yep. for almost three years, I've had this lifestyle, and I can tell you that it's nice to think that you're just gonna fix all your problems if you have the information, but uh, from my experience, that doesn't happen. What nope. you have to figure out is, what really motivates you? And what kind of people can you be around that influence you to be more of the person you want? Yep. Those are the like, things that really change. Like the whole concept, you are your average of your three yes. closest yes. friends. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so big on that, man. Yeah, so me too. The two things uh, on the same topic of how when you move to Nicaragua, like 400 bucks pays all bills, that mind shift, like that mind shift like instead of, instead of like being so worried about cash, I know I, know I had it as well, right? Um, like I, my, my living costs are below, like what is it? My living costs are below my, my earning, right? Yeah. And that is a whole different like thought process, right? You can think longer term. You can think what you are best at. You can think of what you can really relax. Relax, one hundred percent. It's like I don't like so this uh this girl I was seeing for a while like um. Like she, she would, she would rent out a place that is like half or more of her income. Right. Yeah. And then she'd be struggling with like how much like she's trying to pay. And that like rat race, it, it, that mentality is so difficult to like beat. Cause it's just, yeah. it's just the, that rat race. Even once you get out of it, it takes yeah. one to two years for your mentality to actually reflect your new environment. Yep. 100%. And that, that's a problem I struggle with is like, Knowing that I could do more and feeling scared of my death because I know that I haven't done as much as I could, but at the same time, that fear makes me unrelaxed and it makes me less likely to be present and just enjoy a conversation. So it's very tricky because this ultimate fear of death is inspiring me to move forward, but it's also becoming an obstacle when I'm trying to just be there and be present because sometimes the best thing you can do with your day is Present. to talk to people and do nothing and then have a magical eureka moment where you just realize the thing you have to change. But if yep. you stare at the thing you're trying to change all day, you're not going to have that moment. Yep. Cause you're so fixated on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've, I've had the same thing, man. Like why well, is the reason why I travel sometimes, right? Like it, it like clears your mind. Like you're saying, it's yeah, it causes that refresh. Like, yeah. That, push that fucking refresh man and you're just gold and like the whole mindset can shit like the whole mindset shifts like uh the reason why i did the um first start of ebay so i went to um like forbes 39 and 30 in boston i was like i was like telling mom i don't want to go i don't have cash she's like you just gotta go man like, okay sounds good went there and like like that just getting away and seeing other people kind of the two things we talked about like one getting away and like refresh Two, being around people that are um, above you in that whatever level that you want to be, like made me recalculate and come back completely. I, I changed more in that in that trip than I changed on a lot of things. It's kind of interesting, man. I, I, I like conversations. It's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And that, that's what's tricky too. As so, most of my work now is consulting. I like work as a 
people book like a call or two. I don't do too much regular consulting, but usually like people will call me with a specific problem they want to fix or they want to vent about something they're going through in their life um, or they want to learn about Nicaragua or about drop shipping or stealth accounts, all that kind of stuff, right? But there's some recurring themes with the, the consulting. And, and one of the things is that trait, that ability to just put yourself into situations that in the moment you may, like when you're feeling depressed, just having that ability to just be like, you know what, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. That yep. moment is more important than almost anything else. Because if you can just, if you have a part of you, it doesn't even have to be who you are all the time. You just have to have a part of yourself that puts you into uncomfortable situations and yep. pushes you out of your comfort zone. You don't have to be that way all the time. But if you have that one trait, you're going to be able to do almost anything if you just put your time into it. But a lot of people don't have that trait, yep. unfortunately. Uh, humans in general. Let me ask a question. So do you ever run a Amazon like a stealth account or is it only eBay stealth accounts? No, Amazon's next level shit. It's way yeah. harder than eBay. eBay is a very lethargic, easy to manipulate and abuse company. I cannot say the same about Amazon. Amazon top of their stuff. Yeah, yeah. The, I have like four, five, I have four, I have four different eBay accounts we just buy it from, right? Super easy to set up kind of way. Yeah. Right? You can use, use the same like, PayPal it would work too. They wouldn't even ban that. It's interesting. The whole yeah. differentiate for eBay and Amazon, it's a whole different beast. You see eBay starting to become more of Amazon, or is it eBay is going, or is Amazon still going to stay the, the the head chief for a while? eBay, so eBay had a lot of different points in its history. Um, there's two things. If you want to better under, you're listening to this and you want to better understand the history of eBay, there's two main things to look at. One is eBay stock price, and two is the amount of people searching for eBay on the internet. Because if you look at the stock price, you're going to be like, oh, wow, eBay is doing great. They're doing better than they've ever done before. But if you look at the amount of people searching them on the internet, they are at the lowest point in their history. And this yep. is because eBay prioritizes one of three parties. Okay, there's the sellers. There's the buyers, there's the stockholders. Historically, eBay has had a kind of back and forth of prioritizing its sellers and its buyers since the beginning. But we're not in that period of time anymore. We're in the time period where eBay's stated main priority is its stockholders. eBay isn't actually that invested in making itself a good platform for its buyers or its sellers. It's just trying to figure out how it can earn the venture capitalism that fueled it and made it what it is, how it can earn those stockholders more money. And you can find that it's very evident in like the meetings and everything. There's times where the CEO has literally said, stockholders will ask, how are you going to earn more money because customers are leaving eBay, right? Because that's a, that's a known thing. People are making eBay accounts and they're not staying on the platform. They're leaving and going to competitors. So stockholders know this. They asked the CEO and he literally said, we're going to earn more money from our sellers by increasing the selling fees and various other promoted listing strategies. Yep. <laughs> they just directly say that, you know? Um, yep. And sorry, I need to not talk crap about eBay. I get too distracted. There was a ri an original point about eBay, you asked something about eBay, and then I got distracted about that history. It was it was it was little eBay accounts and Amazon accounts. We kind of went uh, kind of yeah, went yeah, down yeah, that yeah, route. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I don't I don't expect that eBay is going to put the level of it's in eBay's best interest to better control the ability to create these accounts and stuff. Yeah. If it cares about its buyers and its sellers. Yeah. eBay doesn't care about its buyers and its sellers. So until that changes, I don't mm. anticipate. Like, if eBay were to become Amazon, that would mean eBay is doing really well. Yep. eBay is not, in my opinion, doing well. It's just shaping how it is and its sheer size to please its stockholders. But if it keeps just trying to copy things of Amazon, it can't win. It's not Amazon. It has to figure out what makes it strong and what makes it different. So yeah. personally, like, yeah, people talk about, oh, eBay's becoming Amazon, but eBay's not a well-run enough company to be Amazon. So I don't agree that, it, like, yeah, eBay's going in the direction that makes it more similar, having a buy box, this kind of stuff. But ultimately, these are pretty small pieces of the puzzle. It's still a different platform, and it's not run effectively enough to accurately say that it's, it's becoming Amazon. I think eBay's best eBay's best quality is the sellers, right? 
like Amazon, you can say that they're so structured that the the sellers are always gonna. It's always gonna be Bezos. Customers always first, right? But eBay has like the sellers are so unique because we work with them on a daily basis, right? They're so unique. They sell such different things. Like you, you can the 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 vast quantity of unique things you can find on eBay are on eBay. They're not. They're nowhere yeah. else, right? It's a global why, marketplace. One hundred percent, right? And that's the reason why, like, like we're like we've been pushing cross selling too, like on our platform, or our our VAs. It's because the traffic you get on the it's and you just add extra traffic on top, right? Because eBay starting the traffic starting to decrease. Oh, actually, no, eBay the traffic starting to grow just because e-commerce is growing, right? But it's yeah. not it's not going at the level. Relative of to all other e-commerce, eBay traffic yeah. is decreasing. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, but there's there's still so big and they still have such good search rankings on Google that you can't, you can't not, you can't knock them in terms of, you can't like, you can't, some people just sell Poshmark and Kari now, but you're losing such a big traffic yeah. sword. It's, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. It, there's, there's no right or there's, long short, eBay, the best thing about eBay is it's sellers. It's not, it's not the buyers. And that, that's something I, I hope that at some point eBay will start really focusing on its sellers, but there's, I don't really see any reason to think that that's going to happen. It, it really looks like eBay is kind of one of the last large monopoly marketplaces, basically, and with time it will be replaced by a wide variety of competitors. I don't think that there's going to be some new thing that just takes over and is everything. Um, maybe, but there's, a, there's an interesting rule, or it's like monopoly theory, and it states that all monopolies fail. Eventually, yeah, sure. you just need yeah. enough time, right? They always fail and get replaced by a wide variety of competitors. If that yeah. hasn't happened yet, supposedly that just means there hasn't been enough time. Yep. And like you can see, like StockX, Go, there's so many of these new platforms popping up consistently, right? It just who can drive the most traffic to it? That's kind of the biggest thing. And, and who, I, like, I, just Macari and Poshmark, they're 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 more they're better for their sellers just because. They have like better return rates and stuff like that. Even as somebody that would buy uh, off eBay, I could, I could, I could like. So I used to buy off eBay to sell on Amazon. Like they're so customer focused that like, like, and plus the yeah, I can go down that path so easy. But it's interesting, hundred percent, man, hundred percent. Damn. I like these kind of conversations. And then, um, so what do you think the next step for e-com is going to be? Do you think it's going to be more decentralized or you think it's going to keep going with Amazon being the biggest dog, they're going to take over the place or the decentralization is going to be the key? Uh, Amazon has so much power. They're definitely like, mm -hmm. like I believe Amazon eventually won't have as much power as it does now, but maybe we won't be alive when that happens. It's a huge yeah. beast. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. And and so it depends what angle are you talking about? Are you talking about like as an individual who's interested in e-commerce, what's the best kind of thing you can do? Or like in general in e-commerce, what direction is e-commerce going in? Direction e-commerce is going, right? Yeah, in that, in that case, I'm not really, I'm not educated enough to really make those kind of answers or predictions really um everything in e-commerce is growing and the environmental circumstance now definitely favors e-commerce and working from home uh it's, this whole covid epidemic has next leveled online work i've personally benefited a lot from the epidemic which is very weird it's weird Same. to be in a position where tons of people are suffering and because of my work i happen to be distributing something that this epidemic just overnight made more valuable so hmm. odd is that is that your drop shipping or what what is no, that no i don't drop ship anymore now i just teach people to use the internet to improve their lives okay. that, that's the basic gist of it because like i said a lot of it's mentality it doesn't matter what sure. the person's doing they need to have that shift they, there's like a flip they need to realize it's their life and they can fix it and they have every answer they need in front of them on the internet most people don't perceive that they're like oh the internet's big but I can't just learn how to do anything I want, but really you can. YouTube, yeah, like what you're, what you're teaching people, even what you taught people with the dropshipping stuff, like that, that could change people's life, whatever it may be. Same thing with any kind of e-commerce, what Chris Lynn does, what teaches like people eBay. The e all the information, like you said, information's everywhere. You just gotta go and grab it and take advantage of it, right? Yeah, we can be examples for people mm -hmm. to see, hey, that's possible. And like, yep. like I like thinking the dropshipping stuff helped people, but really, I think more of what it did 
was it showed people that even a person like me who's just fucking around and messing around can make some stuff happen and change their life. And a lot of these older individuals were like, oh, this young born stoner whatever can do it. I can totally do it. And their egos trip and then they end up working on stuff. So it's not the right reason to be motivated, but if it ends up in a motivated individual, awesome, I'm happy. Definitely, man. Other than that, that's I got all the things on my end. Anything, anything else on your end, man? Not too much. There's actually someone at the door, so I need to end this video soon and go deal with that. Oh, um, man. But again, if you guys are interested in reaching out to Ty or Sid, um, go to hammock.com. It's automation options for almost anything. If you're interested in having a virtual assistant in some way, I'm sure there's a way that Hammock can help you guys. Check out the link in the description or just go to hammock.com. Uh, do you want to share any kind of contact information or can they just contact through the support there? What's best? Yep, contact through the support there. And I just want to say thanks, man, for the invite. It's been talking to you and I'm excited to uh, maybe work together in the future as well. Yeah, sounds good, man. All right, dude. Okay, I'll catch you later, okay? Peace. Ciao.